Hey guys, welcome back to Adventure Fit Radio. Um, you are sitting down or driving, or driving and standing up, but uh, you are listening to uh, Bones, Tom Ahern, um, coming to you live from Adventure Fit HQ. This week we spoke to Diane McGrath. Diane was one of uh, my most... Um, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't wait to listen to her. She. Uh, she is a Mars One candidate. Um, she's in the top 100 in the world to potentially go and live um, on Mars for the rest, the rest of her life to to support and um, and grow the human race. How is that grow the human race? It was great. I. I really. I cannot stress this enough. How how intrigued I was to speak to her. It was a really great podcast. I uh, absolutely loved it. But uh, guys, I want to explain a little bit more. But that's towards the end, but we are we're gonna go through our lovely, lovely, lovely sponsors who obviously we could not be here without. The uh first being Audible. Audible is home to the widest selection of digital audiobooks, including bestsellers, new releases, exclusives, and much more. Much, much more. Listen anytime, anywhere on your tablet, mobile, or desktop with our free app. Audible is offering listeners of Adventure Fit Radio a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to A-U-D-I-B-L-E, so audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. I was about to say Adventure Fit. It's definitely ADVF radio. Do not screw that up, people. Audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio for your free audiobook. I recommend A Universe from Nothing by Stephen Hawking. If you can make any sense of it, like I can, because I'm extremely smart. Oh, I call him Hawken. Oh my God. What is going on here? I recommend Stefan Hawkin, <laughs> a universe from everything. <laughs> Please don't look that up, guys. I recommend Stephen Hawking's A Universe from Nothing. Actually, really fantastic read. I read, I'm going to, I'm actually reading it um, a second time now. It's uh, highly applicable to uh, the podcast you're about to listen to, and it's really fucking cool. This podcast is also brought to you by Loxam Solutions. Loxam Solutions is a boutique consulting and business support company focused on business consulting and commercial services. The oh, excuse me, key to their success has been through the application of a pragmatic approach combined with entrepreneurial spirit to achieve our clients' our goms, 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 goms. Their philosophy is simple. Deliver well-defined, measurable business outcomes to their clients through the engagement of subject matter experts with real-world experience. They can be found at www.locksam, that's L-O-C-S-A-M, solutions.com.au. We are also supported by NDO, No Days Off Supplements, guys. NDO Subs is a newly formed company that aspires to build a trusted brand by having honesty, integrity, and loyalty as the cornerstones of their relationships with all their stakeholders. I know Mac really uh, really relies on NDO supplements um, to get through his day. From suppliers to customers to sponsored athletes and individuals, they will work hard to ensure all receive the utmost attention and support and that harmonious relationships are mutually beneficial for all. Guys, use the code ADVFRADIO when purchasing to receive 10% off at ndosups.com. And lastly but not leastly, that is a direct quote from Bill's uh, last intro, guys. Finally, this podcast is proudly supported by Adventure Fit Travel. This is our mothering company. Adventure Fit Travel is an adventure travel company for the fitness community. Head over to www.adventurefittravel.com to check out all our trips, all our blogs from our blogging team, special offers, and more. You're going to get all the links to the podcast there, guys. We, uh, we've got a really cool uh, Everest trip coming up. Bali's just about to get undertaken. Bill's so keen. He's, uh, he's doing some weird shit over there naked in the corner. It's kind of bizarre. It's weird stuff happens at HQ here, guys. Um, the US is coming up. Um, it's going to be insane. Please jump on board. It's uh, it's awesome. Alrighty, guys. So, Diane McGrath, really amazing guest. I really hope you enjoy it. Let's give it a crack. Boom. Hey, guys. Welcome to Adventure Fit Radio. Sitting here with Diane McGrath. I've got Mac on my left, Tommy over on my right, and before we get into the conversation, as usual, Tommy's tribute. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. House of the Rising Mars. <laughs> hmm. 
a planet in our solar system. They genuinely call it Mars. I don't know why I said genuinely there. And it's been a planet of interest for many a time. A word that rhymes with time is mime. The name Agra rhymes with me and Ma. It's another place I haven't been before. But I think that Mars is probably just a little bit cooler because it's just very <laughs> far <laughs> away. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Really, well, um, really touched the inner soul when I, when I wrote that one. Yeah. <laughs> Very you romantic. Like, um, you like discussing in your songs about what rhymes with I what, know. don't you? <laughs> I really do. <laughs> McGrath like... rhymes with Myanmar. It does indeed. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Good stuff, Tommy. Thank you. So, Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Good stuff. So, um, we're going to kick straight into it. I want to know what, what, uh, what aspects of your life... Um, did you have any role models growing up that turned you into a person who was willing to adventure so far as to go to Mars? Do you have any role models that... Um, role models, gee, I guess your family is always your first point of call there, isn't sure. it? I mean, for me, I think my dad was a huge influence, not necessarily on the Mars side, although in mm-hmm. saying that, he is a prolific reader of science fiction oh, and massive mm. library of everything from you? Asimov. I, I grew up reading this stuff at the age of 11. We lived in the outback in the Territory, yep. in the desert, So, from the, and there was not much to do. Have you read um, Terraformars? <laughs> I have not read Terraformars. I've read, oh. I've read, read Mars, you know, the um, um, Kim Stanley Robertson series. I should um, um, I should give you Terraformars when you leave. Okay, all right. It's a Japanese um, Manga. Oh, cool. Manga comic. Cool. It's really good. It's about, it's kind of like Starship Troopers. It's, mm. um, <laughs> so they go to Terraform Mars and they take a bunch of cockroaches over there, which will eat the moss that they plant there. And then it'll create the, um, it'll eventually over time will create an atmosphere. But the, t- the, the cockroaches under the Mars um, atmosphere, they adapt super quickly and by the time they go back on their second trip they're like 10 foot cockroaches <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a war versus uh versus cockroaches but it's a really good story I'll give you thank you don't they say that on earth cockroaches will be about the only thing that survives yeah that's right yeah. Okay. Yeah. that's right so it'll give you nightmares for um yes for, for weeks but go on so my father so it's my father through i guess the novels and, and so forth but also and uh, when i was a really little girl at the age of six so i'm a i'm a twin i got a twin brother and uh, and anything dave wanted to do I was going to do. Not that I'm competitive or anything, however. Um, but And I wanted to play cricket. So in the 70s, little girls didn't play cricket. Mm-hmm. And so um, my dad decided to coach the local boys team so I could have an entry in. I ha- had to train like anybody else. to play like I had to make the runs, da, 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 et cetera. But Bathroom there bowler? Were, uh, I was a keeper at that age. Oh, really? Yeah, I was yeah. a keeper. Yeah. But I ended up becoming um, a bowler um, and, you know, useful with the bat. Made a ton here and there. So. <laughs> oh, just a lazy um, ton. Yeah. <laughs> becoming a bowler, not getting a bowler, hopefully. <laughs> becoming a bowler. <laughs> yes, I have won, uh, there, few, uh, <laughs> won a couple of awards there in the past. Um, so, yeah, so my dad, I guess he took away that barrier when I was a kid of thinking that things weren't available to me as a mm. woman in particular. Mm. Uh, if, if you think about space travel, there has not been a single woman that's left low Earth orbit. Mm. Really? Only, right. only, wow. only men have gone to the moon. Not a single that's woman insane. has. That's yeah. What's so. the reasoning behind that? Oh, well, in those days, NASA was very much about having um, a male astronaut crew. Uh, they didn't think that women would be able to, to deal with it very well from the physical side, from the psychological side. Don't so women forth. deal with like psychological issues much better than men? Um, in some instances, yes, this is very true. Uh, but it, look, it's very individual. And, and in those days, do if we think about it, back in the 50s, 60s and, and even into the 70s, we didn't understand as much as we do mm. today about how to deal with psychological mm. issues, so mental health, uh, yeah. anxiety, whatever else. Mm. That's really interesting. So, okay, so let's just get straight into it. What happened uh, What happened to start the ball rolling with your plan to um, 
For the listeners that don't know, let's explain to them mm. where you're going with this. You're, you're moving to Mars, Mars. basically. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the, the Mars One mission that I signed up to be um, a, an astronaut for, it's a, a one-way mission to Mars, and it plans to send the first crew of four astronauts to Mars in 2026. Mm-hmm. So that's about 10 years away now. Um, so I've, I've read about it on a blog. Uh, in social media and it was I think it was a science blog and it was a bit of clickbait there it was something like um, astronauts wanted for a one way trip to Mars yeah like, this would be an interesting article yeah. <laughs> <laughs> heck yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes yeah, so I clicked on that and um, and then read about it and I thought so wh- why? You know, <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> I only have, never I only, heard I only, that question. I only before. have one question, and it's three letters, and it's yeah. why. It's probably the most common question mm-hmm. I get asked. Um, why? It's such a it's a small word, but it's such a big question, isn't it? I mean, why do we choose to do anything mm. really significant in our lives? The, the stuff that challenges us, that puts us outside of our comfort zone. Um, some of it's because it's really inspiring stuff that mm-hmm. makes you think yeah I can do this mm-hmm. and and, you know, and it allows you to become the next best version of yourself are you proving to yourself or someone else you can do it no not really it's not about it's not about me um, it's about us yeah it actually it is it's kind of it's, for me it's about a legacy thing mm-hmm. um, and that's one of the things that excited me about the Mars One mission was it was about trying to in, through establishing this colony a settlement on Mars to bring together like a united humanity mm. uh, and to show that we can do this extraordinary thing as a society together uh, and not just this space agency and that space agency and yep. who's going to get there first and blah, blah. Who cares? Let's just yeah. get there mm. and do something useful and exciting and inspiring. So that's, that's what inspires you for this trip. Just go there and set it up. You're not worried about that. You're not going to see your family again or... No, oh, look, we've all... I mean, we've been into exploration for millennia Mm. as a species ever since. I mean, we can think, obviously, those who came to Australia, not just the white settlers, but the Aboriginal Australians. Mm. They came from elsewhere first too. The the cradle of humanity. We sort of expanded from... It's just human nature to want to explore and want to further our boundaries. Curiosity. We're curious. Exactly. We're absolutely. We're curious Mm -hmm. people. We want to know why. Are we alone in the universe? Mm. How did I get here? Did life on Earth start on Mars? So many questions. Mm. Uh, They're the biggest three questions... (coughs) I think in my in my world, yeah. Uh, uh, what are we doing here? Are there people? Are there other people out there? Yeah. I mean, or well, not people, but uh, life, or life, life, any sort of life form, and, and what can I contribute to this world? Mm. I mean, we all want to leave a legacy, and um, in some way or another, people who have children leave children as their legacy. Mm. People who are artists or um, maybe celebrities in some other way, like sports people, leave some sort of legacy that people remember them for. Um, Yep. What do you want? To, what mark do you want to leave in this world? Yep. So that's, mm. you know, that's well, you could be, it. you could legitimately go down as one of the pioneers, one of the leading. Um, you could go down explorers. as explorers, pardon, one of the leading explorers of all time. Absolutely, it's like Chris not, Columbus, yeah. Diane McGrath. Yeah, <laughs> because l- legitimately though, because mm. yeah. of course, you know, it's this is the this is the single biggest thing, if the biggest undertaking to ever be undertaken, in my opinion. Mm. If we if we can make it to Mars establish humans successfully as a mm. two species mm. uh, two colony species two planet species mm. interplanetary yeah interplanetary species is that is that does that factor in with you the 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 interplanetary species thing because I I listen to a lot of podcasts a lot of mm. um, wacky kind of kind of podcasts and obviously Earth's been hit by meteors time after time after time for millennia is that part of the the theory is that part of Baz La- it's Baz, Baz Landstorp's yeah. theory to, to try and prolong or at least guarantee that we're going to survive? It's not part of the Mars One, um, I guess, driving, compelling motions about why they're going ahead. It's, I mean, it's the sort of stuff that we know Elon Musk from SpaceX. Yep. He's, he believes we have to get there. Our time on this planet is limited. Uh, Stephen, Hawking, thing, Stephen Hawking, Hawking, I think, said... I've got a little quote written here. Uh, I, don't, I can't get to it, but... Um, Stephen Hawking said, I think the human race has no yeah. future if it does not go into space. And it's not a surprising thought. I mean, if you think about it, the majority of species that have ever been on this planet, more than 90% of them since the dawn of time, are now extinct. That's right. Yep. We're just another species. We like to think we're a higher and more evolved species, but we're still mm. a species on this planet. Of course. That's right. As long as we're on this planet, we are, we're a volatile. <coughs> time time yeah, will, absolutely. will get the better of us. Um, is it the... The asteroid belt, the Kuiper asteroid belt that we get, we get um, 
I think it's called the Kuiper asteroid, but I may be wrong, but we get blocked through Jupiter blocks a lot of the asteroids that would mm. otherwise crash into Earth. But one of these days, there's going to be something that's going to oh. happen that, that's going to you know collide. And if we've got a colony on Mars, then... Well, you know, keeps your, your toe in a couple of uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. options there. That, that's we've right. kind of got all our eggs in one basket by being on Earth, don't we? At least we can get <laughs> well, some people over on Mars. Why, why Mars, though? Is it just because it's, it's um, you know, realistic for us to you know, without technology at the moment mm. to get there. It's just the closest thing and, and that's it's the next best it. thing or it's, yeah, it's is there anything specific about the planet that we really want to see? Probably the most Earth-like planet in our solar system when it comes to like the number of hours in a day, um, the sort of temperature range, even though it's exceptionally cold in the middle of winter in the North Pole, like minus 155. Okay. But, Wearing a jacket for those. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're on the equator, you know, around summer, you're looking at 22 to 27 degrees. So, you know, so that when it comes to a lot of the aspects about um, being able to survive on Mars, it's more palatable than any of the other planets in our solar system. So there is water there through frozen uh, water in the, in the soil and the, the ice caps. Um, there is obviously access to, to, to sun because we're not that much further out from mm. the sun, so solar power. So there's lots of reasons why Mars is an attractive planet for, for us. Yep. And you're right, we've been there. We've, we've been able to send, I think it's like 43, well, just sent Exxon, uh, Exo Mars. Yeah, I saw there. that. That's so 44, cool. yeah. 44 missions to Mars since the 60s. Yep. So really? we, can, we can get there, yeah. Mm. And it's legitimately the only other habitable place that we can, we can really we have in our solar system. Yeah, I mean, there are some uh, people who think we should go to the moon first, mm. uh, which, of course, we have been to the moon first. But back to, uh, the, but moon. Back to the Go back to the moon, set up a base and mm. so forth. And it is in some of NASA's plans. Uh, and there's a few... That's ast- for longer space travel and, and like a petrol station, basically, isn't it? Is that well, what they're going to use it for with NASA? NASA's concept is to use it as a proving ground okay. before they go to Mars. So yep, get the right. technology right for long duration periods in space, like away from Earth, but still only a few days drive, so to speak. Yep. You know, you can get you can get to the moon in three days. Yep. Whereas it's gonna take you a minimum of seven months pretty much to get to Mars. So if something goes wrong you can zip back to Earth without too much difficulty for the moon. Yeah. You can't just pop on a plane and hop back to Earth very easily from Mars. Mm. But right. yeah, so the technology, yeah, we can get there. And we can yep. land heavy things on Mars. Yep. The last rover, Curiosity rover, is about a tonne roughly in weight. So it's pretty heavy. Yeah. Uh, so we can land heavy things there. So we do know, and, and NASA have started to see this as well. I mean, the Mars One concept was to send most of the technology there in advance and land it in modules, 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 instead of sending massive giant ship that we don't know if it can land. Yep. Um, mm. And so we've now seen... Agencies such as NASA go, oh, great idea, let's do that too. Yeah. So That's is NASA so. is NASA part of the part of the team here? I get the feeling when I read articles and I see, I see, I see what's going on with Elon Musk and SpaceX and and NASA and then Mars One. I get the feeling that Mars One is the kid that no one wants to. No yeah, I out. thought it was like a privately funded sort of thing. Or yeah, well, it, it, well, it yeah, is. it is. It is yeah. in uh, many ways. It's a not-for-profit organisation, yeah. and the majority of its funding comes from private investors at the current stage, and that's funded um, a number of years' worth of work and a few more years, years yet to come. And they do investment rounds every now and then to, to bring more investment. I heard in. they were going to make a TV series, like a Big Brother type of thing. Not quite. Um, they are going to end up s- selling media rights in the future mm. because who wouldn't want to watch oh. out humans step on another planet? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it would be the biggest TV, TV media uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, like 50,000. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'd pay big money for it. Yeah, well, th- think about it. I sort of I refer to this as the, the Olympic method. Uh, I mean, the last yes. Olympic period, they raised $8 billion for mm. the last Olympic period, which is the summer and winter together. Mm. And they estimate that Mars One forecast it'll cost at least $6 billion to send the first crew to Mars. It'll probably cost a bit more by the time, you know, there's changes in technology yep. and stuff. But still, you just need that sort of amount of funding. Boom, and then you've got... And we spent... It was going to be $15 billion for the East-West link. Yeah, oh, don't get me started on the bloody East-West link. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to Mars, Mars twice. Yeah, yeah, it's that's incredible right. How small mm. the, um, it's incredible how small the budget is in yeah. for NASA for space exploration. And I, I've heard Neil yeah. deGrasse Tyson talk about it numerous times about and I think I may be making I may be getting this wrong but I think it's the Kuiper belt do you want to have a Google? yeah I'll have a um, uh, Michael Google so the Kuiper belt and this is this is so we can protect ourselves from asteroids we can spend more time staring into the stars and, and exploring because there's such a small such a small budget for it and I think the fact that they are looking at 
doing uh, uh, some sort of a television program, whether it's like a Big Brother in space, or whatever. I think it's great because it's going to bring more public awareness yeah. to the issue. Yeah. It's gonna. It's the same as The Martian. I saw as soon as The Martian came out, every NASA post that came out on their social media was like, it was like a, uh, a split screen. Hey, check out the Mars um, rover on The Martian that Matt Damon used. Here's our technology, what yeah. we're working on. So they piggybacked mm. all The Martian success. Yeah, guerrilla marketing. Yeah, exactly, which was... Huge. I, I went, yeah, exactly. I don't know what guerrilla marketing is. I have no idea. I just pretended I went with it. But, um, so doing perfectly guerrilla marketing tactics, but it's, it's great because it's bringing the public excitement back to space travel yeah. because that's why we stopped going on the moon because no one wanted to fund it because no one wanted to do it. We'd, we'd been there. What did, mm. you, know, you know, you need the public's backing. And I think if we were to have, um, we were to have this, um, yeah, this, this big brother type mm. style. I mean, is the so this isn't in the works because I Not thought you'd be able to do no. this with like a so, so the training would be able to. Be I thought the, the training, training was yeah. yeah, yeah. We're, going, we're definitely going to be having the well the the final round of selection which is coming up that'll be filmed. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with aspects of the training throughout the ten years of training and then obviously our life going to and on Mars mm-hmm. um, that'll be filmed as well. But it's it's going to be the sort of stuff that you then. You, who's going to want to watch me brush my teeth you know, after a few times? Well, you do well, have really nice well. teeth. Like I'd, <laughs> yeah, I'd want to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so Once. she strokes up and then... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but after a while, like you know, the mundane yeah. becomes very mundane. So the concept is to, to make it into like documentary yep. series. Yeah. So yep. much more exciting and interesting. Three-month periods or, or like two-month well, periods of what's been happening on the... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Highlights. You don't want to watch us sure. sleep. You see us sleep the first night. Otherwise, they're going to get you to, to mm. do... Um, 50 star jumps when they're <laughs> like all, Which, all, really? the, all the big brother um, bullshit that they used to do but yeah okay so so it it's, is, well, it is it's the Kuiper Belt by the way the yep. Kuiper Belt Kuiper Belt what's it yep. say read it out to us so um, soon after so the Kuiper Belt is a region of the solar system that exists beyond the eight major planets extending from the orbit of Neptune to approximately uh, to the sun it is similar to the asteroid belt in that it contains many small bodies or remnants from the solar system's formation so it, Every, sa- it sounds like that everything it's, it's that exists is from the Kuiper Belt. Yeah, yeah. So we've yeah. got we've got everything that's able to totally ruin humanity. We've tracked. They say that's in the Kuiper Belt. We we know about all those. But like Tunguska, in in Russia. Yeah, in the Tunguska, early yes. In nineteen in nineteen hundreds. Yep. Um, Tunguska and the one that flew over did a flyby last year or whatever it was mm. entered our solar system. We don't know about those because we haven't spent the money to yep. try and track them and we can't find a lot of it. But that's what I was talking about with Neil deGrasse Tyson trying to like. Promote. He's so amazing because he's. Um, he talks about how how realistic the the danger of these asteroids yeah. is, isn't it? Yeah, because sure. it's serious. I mean, Tunguska would have been a huge um, incident if would it hadn't have just landed. City. Yeah, a whole yeah. city. Yeah, it's insane, isn't it? Yeah, but no one seems to. Uh, yeah. Anyway, well, most people live contained in their own little lives. Yeah. So they'll yeah. worry about that if it hits them. But we're not. We're better than them. <laughs> <laughs> so the funding. So the funding isn't coming yep. from. Um, Big Brother style. It's you've actually got how much funding is there for you, you uh, private from the private sector for the first trip and for the second yep. trip because it's every four years you're going to take four more that's astronauts right. over to Mars. That's right? correct. So um, the the forecast funding is um, required for the first crew would be six billion. Yep. That includes all the training leading up to that, and the um, there's a number of technical missions that will go prior. So mm-hmm. the first one is a lander mission in 2020 2022 two sort of period and yep. that will be uh, to test some of the, the basic technology for life support so can we extract water from the soil yep. can we convert some of that to oxygen it's all done by robots yeah exactly well the the concept is to take something say like the, the Phoenix um, Mars lander that was uh, Lockheed Martin um, uh, design and, and just modify that to send off so you're taking so not quite off the shelf but Mm-hmm. I'll take this and can I have these adjustments made right. uh, and then send that off. So it makes it affordable. You're not actually yep. having to do something significantly new. You work with existing stuff, but you still need to test this material that you, you're wanting to, to to use for, well, surviving on Mars. One of the things I want to test is the right sort of solar panels. So mm-hmm. the concept is to send a number of thin film um, solar PV to see which one's going to be the most efficient for, okay. the, for the community. Yeah. Right. So all your power will be coming from solar energy. Solar, yep, that that's right? concept. Yep. Okay. It's proven. I mean, it, solar's yeah. been working on Mars for, gosh, well over a decade. Right. I mean, the and earlier to, rovers. Yeah, enough to su- mm. for the whole the whole community that you're going to send yeah. over there. Yeah. So you'll send you'll send um, all your supplies before you get over there, and that's the robots correct. will set up all the essentially the yeah. and 
yeah. even the habitat and, and everything over there. And yeah, and it's a sort of concept that um, NASA are now starting to look at as well for the future. So uh, basically doing robotic construction work. Yeah. It's not unusual. That's we insane. do it already on this planet. Uh, so it's, it's just something that you know we haven't done on Mars yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although we have got rovers there, of course, but they're yeah. doing mostly scientific experimentation, whereas these are much more functional robo robots. Right. I thought they just took so much time to do anything, the rovers, that I just couldn't imagine. You know how it moves moves like mm. a foot an hour, it seems like, the rover? Yeah. Well, it's also it takes a lot of time for... Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Yep. I should sign up for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know more about it than yeah. me. Uh, yeah, it's because of the, the technology, the communication. It's uh, to get a signal from Earth to Mars yeah. takes a, a minimum of three minutes, maximum about 22 minutes one way. Yeah. So, you know, you might see in the camera this interesting looking rock about, you know, three metres away. You go, so send the signal to the, the rover. Please go and pick up that rock. It'll get that mm -hmm. message maybe between three and 22 minutes. It'll go over there, pick it up. And then you'll finally get an image back maybe 22 minutes later. And you go, no, 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 not that one. The one afterwards. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it just takes ages to get anything. And NASA even said what a wrong. rover takes a day to do, a human will be able to do in a minute. That's right. So oh. the, the advances that we'll be able to make just by having the humans on Mars yep. uh, will be significant, mm. really significant. So what about the living conditions? Are you mm. worried about, see, for me, the, the fact that you're going to be living in a sustained... Mm -hmm society that's mm. you're never going to be able to be outside again yeah tell us about the living conditions for one how big are the habitats going to be and so yep. forth and are you worried about that i mean obviously that's the, one of the biggest worries psychologically for yeah. for um the mars one the, the people that are leading the the mission but are you worried personally about that um not around how large a living space you'll have I mean, my last apartment when I, uh, it's actually it's pretty big <laughs> it's like a, i had a tiny little bed sit in the middle of the city here in melbourne and, and this is just like you know nearly eight, eight times the size <laughs> like sweet it's palatial your, is that your, is that like your own little house you get your own little section? um now how it's going to work so the the first cruise um, supplies that will be sent will include two landing modules that will have inflatable sections that will be the living quarters and they're roughly about as long as Say a, a swimming pool, uh, and about as, yeah, so about twice as, my <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and about twice as wide. So it's actually right. quite sizable, and you have two of those for a crew of four. But then within, um, I think it's like a less than two months of the first crew arriving, all of the supplies for the second crew arrive. So you've got so redundancy built later. in for the crew that come two years after that. Oh yes. So yep. you've got two years to set up their equipment, but then that also gives you straight away if you set up the the sleeping quarters, but you've all got this huge mm. um, space to yourselves. Mm. So um, there's actually a lot of redundancy built in there for obviously living um, arrangements, but also for life support systems. So there'll be two sets of life support systems, mm -hmm. um, food production systems and so forth. So there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of uh, health concerns as well, obviously living mm. in Mars. The, um, the fact that it's uh, extreme radiation. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're only allowed out for couple of hours at a time yeah that's right day. about an hour it depends on a number of things depends upon your age uh, and your gender usually um the women um the the guidelines about how much radiation you should be exposed to before you start having obviously health risks mm. uh women are, are more susceptible to her, um, health concerns through radiation exposure so we're supposed to be exposed to slightly less uh and if you're older however because it's all about the accumulation of yep. radiation exposure. Um, if you're older you, and you haven't been exposed to much, you can actually cope with more. So those who do go to Mars, if you're a bit older, mm -hmm. you can go outside for longer because your life expectancy on Mars is already going to be slightly less than the others anyway. Mm. Right. Um, so yep. I could probably go out for two to three hours a day versus one to two yep. because I'll be um, 46 now. So I'd be in my mid to late 50s at that mm -hmm. stage. So you know, normally and shorter life expectancy so I can cope with more. And you're worried about, uh, with the radiation, you know, birth defects in the future? And um, Well, the first, I guess the first aspect about the radiation exposure is that if we do keep it to those sorts of time periods uh, outside um, when we're wearing the spacesuits, is that it's probably not much different. In fact, it's probably more time outside than what many people spend outside on Earth. Yeah, so, right. Uh, most people that I know will often go from home to the car, to the office, to the car. Sitting so inside all day, yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, well, those of us who do exercise a lot, mm -hmm. different. Might, those of us who run or play sport outside, different story, but that's not everyone. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so with the, with the, just touching on, you just mentioned exercise. Mm. So inside the HAB, mm -hmm. the living 
structure. So the air pressure is going to be the same as Earth, but the gravity is not going to be, right? Gravity is not. No, the gravity is 34% or 30? uh, 38%. 38%. So it's about a third, roughly about a third of what Earth's gravity is. So, um, but we'll, so we'll still have to exercise to yeah. help maintain um, bone density, bone muscle density, mass. Yeah. And, and, and what so do they say? What, what are the projections for, for, for life on Mars? I mean, what, what are you actually, what's your body going to go through? Even with the exercise, what's your body mm-hmm. going to go through? If, well, they haven't been able to tell us exactly what the, um, I suppose, percentage decrease is likely to be. We know on the space station that if astronauts do not exercise or do anything to mitigate against um, loss of bone density or muscle mass, that, for example, bone density, they'll lose uh, up to 20% of their bone density mm. in six months. Chris Hadfield mm. lost 50% of the, okay. the, 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 the um, density around his hips. Yeah, wow. and it's mostly... It's, in it, nine months. Right? Yeah, it, it does go from basically the ground up, so to speak. Yep. So you lo- tend to lose more in the lower parts of the, the body than towards the, the top. Because if you think about it, where is most of your striking and your um, your loading occurring when it comes to 1G, weight Course. bearing? Yeah. Yep. It's Absolutely. down. Yeah, it works its way up. So they don't astronauts don't lose as much bone density in the upper body. They mm-hmm. lose most of it in the lower body. Yeah. Uh, so the sort of work they do at the moment on the space station is um, they use you know, a l- a bike, a treadmill, uh, and weight bearing exercise. So that, as in um, s- strength uh, work. As how does that work then? It uses a, a, a it's a pressurized system. Pulley system. Like yeah, a, like not pulley. System. It's uh, it uses like a, a vacuum. So, yes. so you can it's yeah adjust yeah, the right. vacuum, right. yeah exactly. I was literally I was picturing. I was like, Hang a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at me lift a ton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I'm getting strong here. Yeah. yeah right. With the I wanted to talk um about that radiation again. Yeah. That was really interesting. Um. Do you know the the numbers specifically? I don't, don't think you mm-hmm. said you did before, but I was wondering um, about the comparisons that um, a lot of us in modern day life now mm. are exposed to radiation um, as compared to how it would be on Mars. Because we we have it all around us now. You can see all the screens around us, and yep. they're yeah, saying there's well, some increasing concerns towards that. This is very true. I mean, the the more uh, Wi-Fi and other forms of radiation around us, the obviously it increases our exposure. Mm. Um, we will be exposed to a lot more radiation going to Mars yep. mm-hmm. uh, and on Mars than we would be in a lifetime here on Earth. Okay. This is one um, of the biggest controversies biggest from, isn't well, it? from from other outsiders yep. looking in. Is a lot of people, a lot of people think that you're going to die from the radiation, right? Mm. Not trying to be rude, no, but no, I'm no, just saying fine. that's what a lot of. The I would like to. There's this bit before you die, and it's called living. Yes. Um, so <laughs> we'll when I get to Mars, my plan is to do a bit of that living stuff yeah, first yeah, on Mars, <laughs> and eventually, yeah, of course, I'll pass away on Mars. Whether yeah, it's, for sure, but whether it's going to be of old age or you know some pre-existing family condition, or who knows? Um, if it is from a, a health concern that's brought about by radiation, then then that is my you know across the bear or whatever, but um, but I'm not studies, concerned the studies about are, that. The studies have shown that it, the, the studies from Mars One think it's not it's not as much. The modelling that's been done um, that ex- ex- indicates that we only should be exposed to about an hour or two hours a day is yeah. the sort of thing that allows us to to stay within what are considered the safe limits cool. gotcha. that have been set by NASA. Yes, and, gotcha. yeah, so that's I'm comfortable with that, yeah. uh, and to know that those of us who are a bit older can can take a little bit more fantastic but yeah i'm happy to one or two hours a day that's yeah. fine especially no i can still run a marathon in that sort of time frame on mars because you know the, with the gravity being a third, <laughs> I, keep going, going, yeah. I can knock off a marathon about an hour and a half yeah <laughs> well so i suppose you're yeah. never gonna have everything you're never gonna have everything on your uh you're never gonna have everything ticked off i eh? look we were discussing business just before and we were talking about there's never a good time to there's never the right time to start a business yeah you just gotta do it there's never the right time to go to mars probably either because you have to learn as you <laughs> As you go, you have to learn by getting there. And someone's got to do it first. You know? Someone, it's like anything. Someone's going to do it first. Someone's yeah. going to be but the that's, entrepreneur. That's the beauty. You're, yeah. you're now the first woman person to do X, Y, and Z. You're the first person to run a marathon on Mars. You're that the would first be cool. person to touch mm. down. So mm. tell me, uh, describe the feeling that you're going to have when you put your first foot on another planet. Oh tell, me what, what, tell me what you're feeling. I don't know if I could find words to describe mm. that sort of moment. It's, I guess it's like, you know, put a multiplication factor in front of playing in the grand final and having the, the winning goal lined up in front of you with the last second to go, you know, and, and you're right in front. How do you feel at that moment when that's, when that's your balls in your, your hands and, and you can do this extraordinary thing? You, you, you can't, you can't 
sort of grasp that sort of uh, that moment until you, you're there and in it. And I think for me, that's part of it, being in it. I'm yeah. really into uh, the mindfulness of, of being in that moment. And that's what people af- often ask me, oh, how, do you live for this future thing all the time? Or how do you yeah. live today? It's well, mindfulness. Mm. Mindfulness is huge. You, you've got to be here today. Absolutely. S- especially considering the fact that, you know, you mentioned that analogy before about kicking the winning goal and there's probably maybe like a million people across the country watching her. You're going to have over 7 billion people behind you walking on the planet. That's uh, <laughs> Don't fall. Yeah, don't fall <laughs> over. One small still. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's that's awesome. uh, so I think it's time for, uh, you got some news for us there, Tommy? Yeah. I, um, so, uh, you said you listened to one of our, yes, that's yes. right. Uh, the good about the science is just something, some, some current stuff I like to bring up. Obviously I've made this all science. <laughs> so welcome to our latest, uh, uh, segments called the science, the science and the science. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> um, how cool is this? When visiting the center of a galaxy, nicknamed J0230, pack a sturdy windproof jacket. There you will encounter a galactic hurricane with winds whipping at about 200 million kilometers an hour. <laughs> what? At that speed, nearly 20% of the speed of light, a trip around Earth would take 0.7 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> These are the fastest known winds around a quasar. They're about 625,000 times as fast as the highest sustained winds in any hurricane seen on Earth. These quasar winds get the speed... This is a long... This is so cool, though. I'm talking. (laughs) These quasar winds get their speed from the intense radiation emitted by the disk, which glows as bright as roughly 22 trillion suns. The light comes from gases slamming together as they orbit a black hole with about 2.2 billion times as much mass as the sun. Where are we? Here we go. Light from the quasar, which sits in the constellation Cetus, takes about 11 billion years to reach Earth. Its winds best those of the previous record held by a quasar, which is about 14 million kilometers per hour. It's, uh, okay. Rightio. So, right, I'll probably, I just can't right. keep going. Chapter four. <laughs> so. How are we going to prove that wrong? Yeah, I don't know. It's definitely <laughs> right. It's definitely right. Definitely yeah. right. Sounds right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds about right to me. Yeah. So yeah. let's uh, put this into perspective. Um, so I want you guys to imagine being in this situation. Let's bring it back closer to home. You're an ant. Okay. You've had a long day in the mines. You come home to find your wife, Anne, sleeping with old mate, Boris, who's a superior working for the government. <laughs> Anyways, you, uh, you get out of the colony, you, uh, you find some fresh air, and you've stepped right into Hurricane Katrina. Okay? It's very, very similar. Don't get me. I got the facts right, though. What do you do? <laughs> Imagine if you were in that quasar. What would you do? Well, Bill. if you're an ant, you just ants are strong as fuck. Yeah. Just rip onto the floor and yeah. just... <laughs> me? Get underground. I'd probably just... Cry and get swept off into. I reckon Neverland. it'd be so fun to go. <laughs> you, <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> and just like just take <laughs> one. You hit something <laughs> <laughs> until you hit something. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Hit that that <laughs> quipper belt or whatever yeah. it's called. What would you do? Oh, jeez. If I if I so how would I get stuck in that situation? <laughs> I've never been on the receiving end of my questions, and they really. Yeah, I know. That's why I wanted to give it to <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, oh, mate. If I was if I was God, you were an ant. I was in a hurricane. In a hurricane. What would you do? I would just go oh, underground. Yeah. Dig. What's yeah. that? Get underground. Yeah. Well, get if I if I was this particular ant, go find another colony. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd probably if I was this ant, I'd probably um convince Boris to is come up the to the top with the, me. The yeah. Yeah. Is this, this, the this, the is, this is um. Is this you know that really strong ant in the mine? Yeah. I yeah, know. but he's my mate, so I wouldn't do that. He's <laughs> this guy's sleeping with my wife. Boris. <laughs> Boris. <laughs> nah, look. Uh, oh, Are we gonna I, have to cut this. Yeah. Just. I don't know what I'll do. All right. What's next? Okay. In a so ridiculous. in a pair of twin sisters, this is this is genuine. In a pair of twin sisters, a rare disease had damaged the brain structures believed necessary to feel fear, but an injection of a drug could nevertheless make them anxious. Okay, so basically, these these twins, uh, both these twins at a young age, um, they they ruined their the amygdala, which is the the um, ang- the part of the brain responsible for anxiety and, and that flight or fight response. But they found a drug because. Up until this, previously scientists thought it was just the amygdala that um, was the anxiety uh, responsive part of the brain. But they found an injection. They've injected um, these two twins that um, essentially don't have that amygdala and they can still get a fear response from them. Scientists turned to a more specific cause of fear that stems from inside the body, a drug called isoprotonol, which can set the heart racing and make breathing very hard. 
uh, very similar to 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 um, that feeling of adrenaline. Okay, um, now us three, so myself, Bill, and Mac. Um, have a really firm belief that dealing with mental health in most situations can be eradicated through uh, behavioral cognitive therapy and spirituality and meditation. Mm-hmm. So how do you guys see the more scientific or drugs based approach to dealing with mental health, moreover a spiritual or meditative approach? Uh, I believe meditation and everything is a conscious state. Um, and, and Diane mentioned before, when you're stepping onto, onto Mars, you know, you've got to be present and stuff like mm. that. And so we have disconnected ourselves. Life is moving too fast and meditation mm. certainly grounds you. Mm. for sure and it's meditation's better than any drug because we have the power to control who and how we want to be yep and I think that um, if you know all that sort of stuff they were talking about anxiety in this particular <coughs> in particular situation so I'll draw on that again but like like you said if it's um, you know formed as some sort of part of you by your subconscious then you should be able to take that out your own way rather than looking for the quick fix and getting a drug what do you reckon Bill? Um, I tend to disagree a little bit I Definitely, I'm an advocate for meditation and doing everything naturally and trying to get over these um, anxiety and depression problems that you might have. Or this is anxiety, but um, depression falls under the same, yep. <coughs> same umbrella. But um, I think some people need medication. Some people can't fix their fix themselves with medic. Uh, Do you mean with, with clinical medication. depression or mental illness as opposed to mental with health? anxiety and depression? Okay, with, with anxiety, anxiety and depression. depression. But there's different I, forms. I think there's different forms. Yeah, well, there's lots of different forms, but I'm just saying I don't can't go into every different form. Yep. I'm just saying as Let's, a general, we've got time. <laughs> as a general, as a general, uh, as a general rule, I think meditation is good. Unfortunately, I don't think it works for everybody. Yeah. like absolutely everybody. Yeah. So I think there's a definitely place for for it. But we've rambled on enough. No, no, that's fine. I was I was actually wouldn't mind exploring some of this as yeah, well. From, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, from I the perspective say, of um, the challenges that will be faced by any crews, Mars One, NASA, whoever, going seven months in an isolated environment and then living either the rest of your life on Mars or like NASA plans to do, spend about a year and then come back after picking up a few rocks, there's still going to be extreme isolation and, and mental health is, is, a, is a high health risk that all astronauts have. I mean, in our society, about half of the Australians are going to have some sort of mental health problem in their lifetime. Mm-hmm. Anxiety is really high on the on the ladder. I mean, one in five men, one in three women mm. in Australia. It's really high, and so you know, learning, developing a, a, a fantastic personal resilience toolkit uh, for me that's a, a critical part of this. And um, I've What's been doing a lot kit? of work around this. Um, I'll, I do uh, mindful meditation pretty much every day, mm-hmm. um, especially going to sleep. I I meditate on um, uh, better nails. Um, you know that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. A um, literal bed of nails. It's called bed of nails, but it's it's uh, acu- acupressure um, sort of mat. So yeah, a lot of spike, yeah. spiky mats. Wow. So I lie on that for about ten to twenty minutes, um, pretty much every night, and it just brings you into more uh, a deeper state of sleep. So you yeah. get into more your alpha brain waves. So it basically allows me to help biohack my sleep. So wow, I, I actually I would get have a thought lot it more. would have done the opposite and made you more present because you've got all this shit sticking it here. Like, <laughs> no, 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 you're very you aware. Oh, so you eventually <laughs> relax yeah. into it. How? Yeah, you That's really amazing. do. It's, it's amazing. It's a flight. You, you, you tense and then you up get, or you just, you, get, you just relax into it. You physically, yeah, right. Yeah, it's cool. fantastic. Um, but So I, I do that, and but it allows me to to come to this point because you do, you feel those those spikes and it allows you to focus on, on that moment where you are and then you can bring your breathing into it. Uh, and, and techniques like this, uh, but journaling, I journal every day and do gratitude journaling to, mm-hmm. to be thankful and, and recognize at the end of my journaling. So what did I do that was good today? What am I proud of about myself? Because mm-hmm. it's, as you were saying before, it's not the sort of stuff that people talk about because you, know, you don't want to sound like you're big noting yourself. Mm. But it's not what you're doing. Actually, it's okay to be proud of doing something. Absolutely. Of course. I, I yep. you know, did this fantastic thing today. I, I, I bake great muffins. Mm. What's wrong with saying that? Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's oh, there's definitely a big difference between arrogance and confidence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think more people need to understand that, definitely. Yeah. But do they do they train you? Is this in your mm. training process? Because you're, you're going to live with four people for a very long time. That's right. And you need to Including obviously get training. together as a team. So mm. you would have to be taught some sort of mm-hmm. psychological... Yeah, uh, education. I suppose, yeah, definitely. And, and how to deal with it. That's and part of the training. Would be one of the biggest, yeah, well, we are well, the biggest thing. Wouldn't we it, are. Um, we've started the psych profiling commenced from the application process yep. and also an interview process, and and it will occur throughout the entire For training sure. program. Um, and the the training programs has three prongs to it. There's the technical, 
there's the team and then there's the personal and the personal involves a lot of the stuff around this this personal resilience mm. the the psychology aspect of things um, and somebody in each of the crews will be trained on psychology as well so we'll have essentially a, a psychologist with us yep. on planet which will be important but um and can oh. i ask is is the team are you actually from the start process going as the four people that you train with you are aren't you? so Correct. It's, your fourth, it's the best team gets selected yeah, so yeah, right. each so by the time we finish the next round of selection, there will be six teams of four um, that then you know, basically six crews yep. that will commence the 10 years of training. Um, and at the end of that 10 years, there will be at least six crews that could be ready to go. Uh, Mars One will have you know, people coming in and out all the time. And will they be the crews that will do the second and third and fourth and fifth after the first potentially, crew? Potentially. Potentially. All right. Um, it's so it's like in NASA do that too. To Mars, even if you're not the first. If I manage to get through all the way to the ten years through the ten years of training, um, I've got a, as good a shot of any as anyone else mm. of going. And so, so, what's the selection process? You talk about this selection process, and you go through as a team. Um, mm -hmm. What do you? What are they testing for? Mm. How are they trying to knock you out? Yeah, so it's actually knocking out is the, the probably the right tense to choose rather than just uh, selecting in because what they've been doing all the way along is is selecting, not selecting the, who has the right stuff but who doesn't have the right stuff. Mm. So that leaves those who are you know are in a reasonable pool of um, of opportunity. Um, so when we get to the next round of selection, which is it's really all about team, uh, and that's rounds three and four, which is a combined selection process. The first part of it is um, the hundred of us that are left worldwide. We're brought to this one location. We don't know where it is yet. Mm -hmm. We assume it's in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> We've seen some photographs of p potential sites being scoped. Okay. Um, could be Dubai. Could be Iceland. Cool. Either oh, would be cool. Dubai. Yeah. Dubai is cool. Go that place. Iceland. Cool. <laughs> so cool. Apparently, you know, they have like a theme park there, and apparently they have done like a a um. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A copy. A copy mm. of the Las Vegas Strip. That's bigger <laughs> than the actual Las Vegas Strip. Yeah, I've been Imagine, there. You've been to the Las Vegas Strip? No, uh, Dubai. Oh, yeah, I know yeah. you've been to Dubai. Yeah, I, I didn't, <laughs> didn't like it that much. You didn't like it? Well, I went what? there for the architecture. Ah, I mean, I didn't not like it, but it's just, I went to a hostel there to meet people. Mm. I went to the beaches to meet people. I ended up hanging out in the shopping centers, man. Right. And <laughs> it, was, it was 50 degrees. I went for a swim. The yeah. water was 100 degrees. <laughs> Um, but it was just are really they, hard are to they meet accurate people. Accurate numbers? Oh yeah, I <laughs> they were genuinely hundred yeah. degrees. <laughs> Come on, but, bit of um, on that. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I went there to check out the architecture, which I checked out, which is good. But yeah, yeah I don't know. Hey, Don, I've got mm. one. Yeah, we uh, we've got like a science question that we always do at the end, and this is a question that as soon as I got in contact with you, I really, really, really couldn't wait to ask. Yeah. So, and we drew on a little bit about it before in terms of that. Um, human curiosity and always wanting to yep. seek further and you know this and that do you do you do you get worried that if you do go to mars that's that's the kind of the end for you like you you may not get that next opportunity to see another planet or or go on further or I sort of see it as the it's um the next pathway like it's like most things in life it's you know it, they're milestones towards the next journey mm. so i never sort of see one thing ending as a door closing. Yeah. I always see it as um, a lot of other doors that I can walk through and I'll see going to Mars is exactly the same sort of thing. Once once we're there, it's not over. In fact, it only begins. Yes. You know, we've got an entire new life. We have to set up an entire new society, which isn't just the physical construction, which of course is necessary, mm. but there's all of the research, there's the, the discovery. Um, there's trying to establish what's the right sort of society. And we'll test, and some of the stuff during the training in the 10 years will help determine this we're going to not just learn about obviously psychology and the technical aspects about you know, flying a spaceship um, to medical procedures whatever but but also we'll go back to school and, and learn about politics and uh, social structure and cultural things because we, we're not NASA we don't have to put in place what's in the US we don't have to have a judicial system we don't have to, uh, like the US we don't have to have capitalism we don't, yeah, we don't need is, money this we is the most this. important this, this is, is really the most exciting. Interesting mm. and important yeah. part. Um, we could do anything. For me, I think. Um, I think, is that is that all good for good, the bad, and the science? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just keen to learn again. <laughs> yeah, I think. Oh, um, and when I get back to your question about selection, I have yeah, no, I was going to dive into it as Sorry. soon as we finish. Um, yeah. This would be a good section, I reckon. Yeah, cool. So we'll rounds that. three and so the selection process, the next, the final stage, which is rounds three and four, combines the hundred of us get together. 
and uh, and will be broken up into international teams of about roughly 10 to 15 and uh, and there'll be what the Mars 100 those the 100 of us that are left um, are the remnants of what were over 200,000 people that started the application process stage 1 just an online application online application had to, to do a video, a video right? had to do a video yeah right. it wasn't what did you say in your video uh, we had to say why we wanted to do it, well, yep. obviously. Um, what our sense of humour was like, and right. why we'd make a great a candidate. Yeah. So, <laughs> what, what, did what you was use a joke? joke? Was my, no, I didn't have to say a joke. I oh, thank goodness I can't remember jokes. I'm terrible. Uh, what did my the my say? sense of humour <laughs> yeah. is a bit more. I, I don't mind the odd practical joke. Yeah. So I've got a bit of a dry sense of humour, but I don't. I, I like playing little practical jokes occasionally. Um, just you know, just taking the dinner away from your fellow astronaut. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, you're oh, hungry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. It's just <laughs> letting the air Taking off the hatch. Yeah. Kill your fellow. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I don't mind a bit of a joke. Um, so it was, it was interesting because I guess it, it's important to have a sense of humour because things are going to go wrong. Yeah, for sure. And have if you, seen you the can't, Martian? <laughs> yes, it yes, goes I pretty have. wrong. I think there. that's prescribed, yeah. prescribed viewing for all of us. Yeah, um, that's cool. So, yeah. But out of the hundred of us that are left, mm. we're completely gender balanced. There's fifty men and fifty women, huh? and went from around. I think we hail from about thirty-five different countries around the world. How so many Aussies? Uh, there are seven of us, so we're quite well represented. Great. Yes, well done. Uh, and age range, the youngest, there are two 20-year-old women. Uh, one is a um, Queensland country girl and the other is a, a young woman in India. And the eldest is a 62-year-old gentleman from Pakistan, Reginald, wow. who's uh, just recently retired. Uh, so it's really, div- it's extremely diverse, yeah, which is really it? cool. So And so we come together and the hundred of us have broken up into these groups that are quite diverse and have to go through a lot of team building exercises, yep. essentially, to see can we play well with others mm-hmm. uh, for a number of days? And each day they'll be kicking out about 10 to 20 uh, that, that don't show that they know how to, to work well in each teams. Day is, uh, sorry, each mate, day. Each day during can't. the selection. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and after a handful of days, that'll they'll have us down to about 40. And those 40 then get put in isolation, get locked away in small groups to say, all right, you've shown you can play well with others. Let's see how you do it under stress and pressure. Yeah, how many people will be playing the game though there? You know, and oh, yeah. bring it back to Big Brother again. You know, when you get so watched by people, and y- yeah, there's, there's, that's going to be really mm. interesting because there's going to be so many people that I would imagine that you would see through. Mm. Like but you yourself, you might be like, this just doesn't seem like this. Yeah, guy's but they'll come through we on know the each other personality really tests, well. you know, like the Myers Briggs yeah. tests, and that, they'll yeah. do personality profiles and but stuff. But still, that'll like, come still that in that testing, you'd be so nervous. And there'd be a lot of people that are trying to please people more than they would normally. Oh, do absolutely. But under you know? when it comes to like when we get to the isolation stage of the the selection that's when people will go to form. So their their true nature and behaviour will come out when you're under a lot more stress and pressure. Yeah. Uh, when we're, we, for example, they may decide to um, to make us very tired. When people are overtired, mm. that's when you see people get cranky or mm. or quiet or whatever it is. You know, they have their natural responses when they're really overtired. Yep. Um, so those sorts of things to try and bring out the, the true nature of who we are under difficult situations right. and to see how well how well we solve a major problem. Um, but it's not really about getting the answer correct. It's more about how we deal with conflict and, sure. and work together with this diverse group of people that mm. understand things differently culturally and so forth. So that's really what they're kind of looking for and that'll eventually from that trim us down to, to 24. So that's that's kind of the process. Right. What to do those two 20-year-old women, have you spoken to, to them? Uh, we keep in touch with each other on well, we a number of different ways. The whole hundred of us, well, we email or... Facebook message or Skype or whatever, just about every day. Like yeah, first yeah. thing I just wake up and you're excited and you want to get around each oh, other and like yeah. minded people. You yeah. always want to talk to like minded people. Yeah, exactly. What, what are their motives for going up there? I mean, they've just started. I mean, I'm only 23 myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lot older and wiser than them. But like, <laughs> what, what, what are their motives for, for? Well, I mean, for some people, it's a case of this is the sort of stuff they've dreamed of when ever since they're a little little kid. Um, no matter how old you are now, yeah. you know. And so this is a, and, and it came up as an opportunity when they were still quite youngish. Really, 19, they would have been, or 18, 19 when it first got to apply, because that was two years ago now. And uh, and so but for those of us who are a bit older, yeah, we had those sorts of dreams as kids, but you tend to put it on the shelf a little bit. It's like, mm. oh, well, no astronaut program here in Australia. It's probably oh, well, the biggest number one, the number one thing that I could wish to do in my life would be step foot on Mars. How cool would 100%. it be? I didn't know about the application process. I probably wouldn't have applied. Yeah. You know, I'm probably not willing to leave earth unless i was coming back that's yeah. just me personally you know 
But I I can't think of a bigger childhood dream. Not that I dreamt about I want to go Mars. to the moon. I'd much rather see the Earth, how oh, it is. No, nah, no way. Mars I would for me. definitely. My favorite Mars movie of all me. time is Interstellar. Like, I've seen it about 20 times, I reckon. <laughs> Interstellar changed my life. It, it's changed my. It, has, has it, <laughs> how did it change your life? It did. 100% changed my life. Really? I, you started I, growing a beard. I watched it. I watched Interstellar. <laughs> I was sitting right here where yep. I'm sitting now, basically. Sitting here, and Interstellar finished, and I sat there. The credits were rolling, and my jaw was just open, just staring at the screen. And this guy who was staying with me, Fred, he's a real intellectual um, dude from Sydney. He walks in the door, and he said, "Oh, Bill, uh, hey, hey, what are you, uh, what are you, what are you doing there?" I said, "Oh, I was like, Fred, I just watched Interstellar, man. It was epic." And Fred goes, "Oh, it's amazing how grounded in reality it is as well." <laughs> and at that, I looked and went, "Fucking what?" Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Fred told me about um, the theory of, uh, like, a lot of the theories of, what's the theory about the um, going so fast through time and space mm. that your clock oh, slows yeah, down? Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. that the theory of, what's that? General relativity. No. That's, is that the theory of relativity? No, no, no. Um, whatever that is. Yeah, whatever that theory is. Oh, so, I started, it literally lit a fire, you know, a fire in me to start to get back into learning. Mm. Learning and studying. So, yep. all I do now is listen to podcasts about, I listen to... Um, Space Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah. The Infinite Monkey Cage with Brian Cox, which are all astrophysics and Brian Cox is amazing. Yeah, yeah. and and listen to all the Rogan podcasts with anything anything that's interesting out of left field. And now, like I'm about to start doing the great courses courses on all these things that interest me. I didn't do any of this shit six months ago before I watched Interstellar. Yeah, hundred percent. Cool. I'd kind of like hadn't forgotten about learning but I wasn't mm. excited to learn about yeah. all these aspects that I'd never put any time and effort into and something ignited it yeah. ignited something in you 100% yeah, it yeah. ignited it now, now all like Graham Hancock and all the all the books that I bought and the, the thinking about going and trying ayahuasca in Peru started from Interstellar mm. like it all started from that one thing it literally Interstellar changed my whole excited me about learning again oh, of course it is yeah, time dilation, which is a form of general relativity. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah that's what yeah, I thought. Of course it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the best movie of all time. So, like, of all time. <laughs> <laughs> of all time. You've got hey, underline hey, many, many, many yeah. times. All, all time. Italics and time bold. Space. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because time is, uh, time is relevant with that. With that well, that's yeah. <laughs> the one big variable, isn't it, time? Two questions there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've got a quick question. You mentioned before you... Um, that uh, those two ladies are obviously young-ish, you said, and then uh, it, it's a long process. What happens if you happen to, or you know, anyone happens to meet a partner and they mm. choose they want to have kids or they want to go on a different path? Is it an easy out? Have you committed? whole team would go, right? The whole team leaves yep. the training program at that stage. Right. So it's exactly. one out, all the three others out. Yeah, well, it, but it's like that. I mean, the NASA crew's getting ready for uh, any of the, the major missions <coughs> um, to, to uh, the moon, obviously, as well. I mean, Anytime if someone's sick, you have to replace the whole crew. Mm. So you can't just replace a person because you've all yeah. been trained with very specific roles. So each team of each crew of four will have two people trained in medical procedures, two in dental, etc. So if someone's out, dental, yeah, yeah, going to do extractions. Yeah, and, yeah I suppose. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, you do leave a massive gap. You can't just stick one person in. And there's like that cultural aspect yeah. too. The best fit. Proven to work together. Yeah, work yeah, exactly. Together, so. so you're you're now. Or for the last two years, have devoted your life to it. You, you pretty much, you don't. Do you have a wall up now saying, "Oh, I can't get into it"? I'm just assuming. No, no. no I don't even want to assume. No, no, yourself, don't but, ask me. But let's just like. say that uh, you are single and no, no, I'm in a relationship. You're in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Explain they, how that? Yeah. yeah, she's she's fantastic. She okay. supports everything I want to do. I mean, I spend because I'm not fully employed by Mars One at all. Um, Mars One haven't employed any of us until we get through the next round of selection. Mm-hmm. I spend. Half my life doing my PhD. I'm doing a PhD at RMIT Uni in environmental engineering. Yep. And the other half of my life, well, kind of half my life, doing Mars One mm. stuff. I do wow. a lot of speaking at schools. I go and speak at schools about space science and uh, science. Cool. and But not just that, but I love going and speaking at like girls' schools mm. to get them to think that you can do anything you really want to. It's yeah. okay. And I usually always try and bring up mental health when I'm at schools too because it's a huge issue. And it's fantastic to see the kids really respond to to discussions around mental health. Mm. Yeah, so so I do a lot of that um, in my spare time. While um, we're on the uh, while we're on the family th- uh, family thing, are your mm-hmm. parents both with us? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My and parents. How did they how did they react to the whole um, the whole announcement? My mother is, I think, my biggest fan. Really, she's so lovely. Um, 
And in fact, uh, I can guarantee she will listen to this podcast. I think. Um, I she think. Will. Hey, mum. Hey, my dad's mum. Hey, I think my mum's my, my biggest. I think generally your mother is your biggest. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> my Even if you're a shithead. <laughs> 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 Even if you're just a terrible. And my dad. brother. Yeah. Your um, mum's the one who'll stick. Yeah. Right. My my um, brothers have been fantastic. <clears throat> They've, I've got three brothers. So I have my twin brother. Um, Dave up in Queensland and I've got two brothers here uh, in Melbourne that's um, Peter and Brian and uh, just really supportive and um, just think it's fantastic what I'm doing and my nieces and nephews so all their kids um, think that I'm obviously that very interesting aunt yes um, which is cool so I've got a bit of give them a bit of credit at school sometimes I think uh, but my dad my dad's great he's he's I think it's a I think of that generation, fathers of that era, my father's in his uh, mid to late 70s. Uh, he very quiet but really supportive, always mm. been supportive of whatever I wanted to do. So I'm really fortunate. Not everyone's been as lucky as me. Some of the other guys mm. in the Mars 100, um, their parents haven't been happy at all mm. or not quite disowned but not spoken to them. And that yeah. Mine were like, oh, my God, that's amazing. You know, yeah. Really yeah. excited. It's well, a selfish reaction, so though, isn't it, from yeah. the parents or the other people? It's, but it's, pr- it's pride as well, you know. It's like, yeah. imagine, you know, like you see, uh, do you watch Vikings? No. So Vikings, like the Vikings, when they would go and try and, when they would go and try and find France or new land and you know, all the all the um all the men and there were some women that would go on the ship and they were kissing their loved ones goodbye because you never knew if they were going to come back but they were out exploring and everyone was proud of them hmm. and that's what I think your parents have obviously yeah gone with the more the the pride is the overriding factor rather than the the oh, thought absolutely. of losing the physical contact with you and stuff which is what obviously the other parents that are not taking it so well and it's only a physical it's, it's only a physical contact too I mean if mm. if I do get to be in the final cruise I get to go to Mars and um, I'll have internet Yeah, I'll be able to video message with mum I'll keep my Facebook page up to date yeah. there'll be mum will keep you know, stalking <laughs> me online <laughs> that's hilarious Gotta get those what up, are you guys doing today <laughs> I'm just walking to Mars do you know yeah. the, um, <laughs> the Mars Check rover's got like 5 million Twitter followers oh yeah really when they found water on Mars they found it it was announced through a tweet from the Mars rover <laughs> <laughs> very that's cool insane, right? that's interesting yes I have a Twitter account too very important Snapchat yep. you name it oh yeah that's all up there <laughs> Instagram Snapchat would be so cool <laughs> how do you want Snapchat yeah. oh god oh god that'd be awesome I'd just send one back on the toilet <laughs> yeah I'm not doing anything cool <laughs> but yeah so I'm, yeah, I'm really lucky my um, parents are very very supportive and I did I lived in Europe for a while um, a number of years ago and when I moved to Belgium back in oh, I think it was 2006 where did you live in Belgium in Brussels so actually not very Belgium's far great. not very far from where the recent um, uh, mm. tragedy was I've got a friend in Antwerp Antwerp's amazing yeah Belgium's a there. Belgium's a surprise it's so country. underrated people it's nearly exactly. my favourite country in Europe I think that's why I like it as well people yeah. go oh yeah I'll just go to France I mean I love France, I love France, I love Germany, I love Europe, full stop. Mm. Um, but they, they forget that there's this little country in the middle that kind of gets caught up in everything oh, else. And so good. Yeah, I really it's, like it. Mm, great chocolate. All righty, gang. That was, uh, that was part one of, um, of Diane McGrath. We just finished on the good, bad, the science. I, um, that, was, that was probably one of the most intriguing um, and interesting podcasts that um, we've done on the show. And the I believe that the uh, the second part gets even better because it's 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 really uh, really personal to Diane and it's um it really it really puts things into perspective into in terms of what she's really about to do here. It's um it's quite a it's quite an undertaking to if when you think about it not um not uh, seeing her loved ones again and you know in the flesh and um and doing all this sort of stuff. So please uh please listen on. We're just gonna quickly go through our sponsors again, guys. Uh, so this podcast and obviously all of the rest um, is, uh, support, is supported by Audible. So Audible is uh, home to the widest selection of digital audiobooks. Uh, it includes bestsellers, new releases, exclusives, and much more. Again, guys, jump on um, audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio to uh, get on um, with a free download and a free 30-day trial. I recommended uh, Stephen Hawking's Universe from Nothing. Jump onto that one if you can. Also, The Martian, obviously very applicable to uh, the Diane McGraw. Uh, Loxam Solutions team, um, that boutique consulting and business support company, jump onto loxamsolutions.com.au. We're also supported by NDO Subs. Subs! No diesel supplements. So, use that code ADVFRADIO to receive... 
10% off at ndosubs.com, yo! And uh, Adventure for Travel, guys, keep uh, keep supporting. We're going overseas, we're doing all the stuff, have a read about blogs, look uh, look at our dirty faces on the social media, you'll love it. Alrighty, team, let's uh, get excited for part two. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.